You are listening to a free version of Majority Report with Sam Steeter. To support the show and get another 15 minutes of daily program, go to majority.fm, please. The Majority Report with With Sam Sam Steeter. It is Thursday, May 17th, 2018. My name is Michael Brooks, and this is a Michael Thursday on the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We're broadcasting live. Steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On today's program, David Erbati on Univision is an effing mess. The story of a leveraged buyout, a media conglomerate, financial deregulation, the destruction of journalism, and poor strategic planning for millennial and Hispanic audiences and how it affects all of us. The Mueller investigation enters its second year and all of us want to know where exactly is it heading? Rudy claims that Mueller told him that he cannot indict a sitting president. We'll see about that. Jared Kushner supposedly got very agitated and upset when the Russian meeting didn't deliver the goods. No dirt on Hillary Clinton. And a Qatari businessman has claimed that Michael Cohen asked him for a million dollars. I wonder if this gives us some new insight on the blockade of Qatar. European, ex-European heads of state from a variety of center-left parties sign a letter urging the release of President Lula in Brazil and allowing him to seek re-election. President Obama, who once called Lula the most popular politician on the planet, should follow their lead. And Rand Paul, he still wants to know more things about Gina Aspel as the countdown clock Uh, ticks for his almost certain sellout on the issue and Donald Trump is now urging a Justice Department under Jeff Sessions to criminally investigate Oakland's Democratic mayor for attempting to protect immigrant communities in her city from ICE terrorism and A Democratic rising star in a swing district gave $300,000 to pro-BDS groups as balance and more genuine fundamental concern for human rights at least takes some energy presence in the Democratic Party. And Rex Tillerson threw a whole bunch of subtext and shade at Donald Trump. He's still an oil baron who has his own abominable record. And substitute teacher on hunger strike is he reminds everybody that they are, of course, also tremendously abused by the system. Uh, with us uh, today, it's a, uh, I guess it's a bro contingent. It's a bro day. Yeah, it's a bro day. So, uh, so, yeah, uh, what's up, guys? Like, how are you doing? How are your gains? Let's just start with this. Um, You know, there's obviously a Donald Trump outrage machine, and there's obviously the balance of, uh, you know, covering the disaster. I mean, we didn't even deal with, I mean, Democrats actually pushed through a symbolic vote to protect net neutrality, which will die in the House. And if it somehow made it miraculously through a Republican House, of course, it would be vetoed by Trump. Uh, You know, Republican Washington and the Trump administration are awful in every conceivable possible way. They're harming human beings across the planet every single day. And they're also just a collection of, you know, some of the worst, most disgusting people on planet Earth. Trump, Carson, you know, the whole disgusting cabal of them. And, you know, we've got to cover many other things. We've also got to put this sort of grotesque manifestation of Trump into the context of American capitalism and everything else. So, you know, it, it's that sort of give and take. Uh, and then also, you know, the, the comedy of it. 
uh, but it's a give and take of not indulging into every single thing that you know this this scum does. Um, you know, and being in that sort of outrage cycle. But this comment yesterday, especially in the context again of what we see every day, we see ice terrorism every day. We see. Uh, families being ripped apart. We know that part of the plan uh, that now is being developed to uh, separate small children uh, and all children from their parents uh, if they're attempting humanitarian refuge at the border. Um, And could you imagine knowing this administration, let alone, by the way, there was real mistreatment under the Obama administration as, as well, obviously, let's be clear. If you're still attempting to flee your situation today, with these gangsters in office, imagine what you're trying to get away from in Honduras, as an example. Honduras, of course, a coup state, um, going back to 2009, backed by the United States. That being said, this was Donald Trump uh, yesterday. Uh, Sometimes it's important to lay bare the inhumanity the fundamental racism, the fundamental dishonesty, and the fundamental grotesqueness of the person who sits in the main chair right now. We have people coming into the country or trying to come in. We're stopping a lot of them. But we're taking people out of the country. You wouldn't believe how bad these people are. These aren't people. These are animals. And we're taking them out of the country at a level and at a rate that's never happened before. And because of the weak laws, they come in fast. We get them, we release them, we get them again, we bring them out. It's crazy. So that's the language of fascism. That's the language of eliminationism. You look at Rwanda radio talking about cockroaches before genocide, as an example. You look at the rhetoric of the genocides in Bosnia. And obviously, it's not the same situation, but the rhetoric is on the absolute same continuum. And I don't see criminals every day. Every single day, I see families being ripped apart. I see homes being uh, barged into without search warrants. I see comedians being harassed for joking about ICE. I see a guy in upstate New York, a farmer, uh, you know, getting threatened by ICE while they terrorize one of his employees. I see some scumbag jerk off in Midtown threatening to call ICE on people speaking Spanish at a salad bar. That's what I see. And I see a racist, trust fund baby, scumbag president who has less than no integrity. There's no concept of integrity in any of these people administrating one of the biggest grifts in American history, a grift-based country. That's what I see. And so it is an important reminder sometimes to be clear about what we're dealing with and every single person in Washington who empowers them, Paul Ryan and all the rest of them who still want to make some faint at respectability, even as they empower Trump and administer Uh, a full frontal assault on 99.9% of Americans. Okay, we're going to take a brief break, and we'll be right back with David Urbati. We're talking about why Univision is an effing mess and much, much more. It's a great piece of reporting. Welcome back to the Majority Report. I'm Michael Brooks. Joining us now is David Uberti. He is a media reporter for Splinter. David, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me on. How's it going? It's going well. You uh, co-wrote a very, very in-depth piece along with uh, Kate uh, Conger and uh, Laura Wagner uh, on basically it's entitled, and I, I guess I will edit it for the public version of this show, (laughs) <laughs> Univision is an effing mess. Uh, and Univision is, of course, uh, in some sense, is, is in fact your, your parent company, uh, right. in fact, which uh, I, so I like the piece already. Um, take us back, though. Explain to people what Univision is and uh, the, you know, its, it's, it's history as a media conglomerate and how it got where it is today as a business. 
So Univision is a large Spanish language broadcaster, which targets the Spanish language market in the United States. Um, so the start of our story and really the framing that you need to understand uh, the current state of Univision through is a leveraged buyout uh, mm -hmm. made in 2007, where essentially a group of private equity investors pooled together a lot of money, pooled together a way more debt and purchased Univision. They basically brought it under their control. So the way leveraged buyouts work is essentially private equity investors, they go to banks and they say, hey, we want to make this purchase. Will you give us loans? The banks say yes or no. In this case, they said yes. So these private equity investors essentially saddled Univision in 2007 with more than 10 billion with a B dollars in debt. So everything that's happened since then, whether that's, you know, the push for cost cutting, the push for additional revenue, various uh, plays for digital expansion and the resulting mismanagement really stems from this gigantic uh, loan that we are still paying off to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars each year. You explain, and one of the things I really, really liked about the piece was the sort of the intentionally convoluted language around what a leverage buyout is. I've told this story before, uh, uh, but I, I'll say it again. I remember one time, and it was it was funny. Like I was literally running on a treadmill at the gym, and there was a guy who, you know, I've I had you know. Uh, a gym acquaintance, you know, a guy, you'd say, Hey, what's up? How's it going? Blah, blah. And he was a wall street guy. And, you know, he loved, I mean, I, it, you know, it was funny. Like I, you would think I might be the more, you know, I'm like the, the left wing media guy. Uh, but I just wanted to take my run and, and, and listen to Nas. And he, uh, and he, you know, wanted to debate me basically about, uh, about, I don't remember even the specifics, but I remember at one point, you know, he's throwing all this language at me and he's saying like, well, it gets really technical and, you know, I mean, I'm not, you know, I, I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, you're a really smart guy, but I mean, you know, I worked at the bank and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and I said, and I finally was like, dude, you know, look, I get it. But like, I watched Goodfellas and, uh, <sighs> you know, like you're basically describing, uh, you know, and, uh, and I think, and I'm sure, you know, Matt Taibbi's used a million examples like that, ways in which like what you just described is not that complicated, but right. they sure make it sound complicated. Right. Yeah. I mean, we, we make the point in the piece that the jargon that the financial sector uses is more of a feature than it is a bug. So, you know, they have all these weird accounting metrics that use a lot of acronyms um, that basically prevent lay people like you or me understanding what the hell uh, is being discussed. So the most important one when we're talking about big companies that have undergone leveraged buyouts like Univision is this ratio called debt to EBITDA ratio. And EBITDA is this acronym that stands for earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, which is a fancy way of saying the amount of money a company makes every year. So, <laughs> right, you can just say earnings. <laughs> right, right. I mean, right. Or but if, if, yeah. if, we're, if we're going by sort of the technical accounting metrics, you know, I'm sure people on Wall Street will quibble with, you know, the difference between earnings, quote unquote, sure. versus EBITDA. Okay. There are different accounting metrics that, that may be used. But sure. for, for all intents and purposes, EBITDA is how much money a company makes every year. Right. So, when Univision was purchased in, in 2017, or 2007, rather. Its debt to EBITDA ratio, the amount of debt it had compared to the amount of money it made every year, was about 12 times, 12 to 1, which is an absurd level for that anybody who insane. understands basic, yeah, basic economics or anything. It just seems like an insurmountable uphill climb. And to this day, we are still sort of drowning under under that pile of debt. Univision is a pretty lucrative company. It has a, has a pretty vast and sprawling TV business. They make about $3 billion in revenue every year, but it still doesn't compare to the amount of debt that we have. How did Univision basically build up its business and start making money? And uh, what was the, you know, uh, the last the last thing I'll sort of ask in the kind of preambles, what, what was the story behind this, uh, this takeover in 2007? I mean, the, the story behind the takeover, which is still a story that Univision is telling today, is that the the market for Spanish language media in the United States is not only gigantic, it's tens of millions of people, but it's also vastly underserved by traditional media companies. Mm -hmm. 
So investors, when they were thinking about this in 2007, they, they were basically making the argument that demography is destiny, that the, uh, the Hispanic American population would continue to grow over the coming years and decades, and Univision was poised to take advantage of that market positioning. So they base, the, the, the basic money makers for them in this situation are primarily things like you know, soccer coverage, uh, entertainment coverage, and also telenovelas, which are essentially Spanish language soap operas. No, my, my are, uh, producer Matt's a huge fan of those. Yeah, right. I'm, yeah, yeah I'm not yeah, surprised. Yeah, I mean, them, a lot yeah. of people are a yeah. lot of people are huge fans of it, That's and uh, you know they relied on these telenovelas for a large portion of their history, and they were hugely popular for many many years. But so they would buy some, those from say like like a Mexican conglom a Mexican station, and basically just buy the rights, broadcast them in the United States, and make a nice profit in the in the right. crossover. Okay, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. There's a company in Mexico called Tele. Uh, Televisa, which essentially is a pipeline to Univision for all of these Mexican soap operas. Um, and that's part of the reason why they're struggling right now is because the younger viewers, you know, uh, people about, about my age, people who speak both English and Spanish at home, uh, they don't like uh, the sort of traditional soap opera setting as much as they prefer, you know, narco centric right. uh, TV programming. Right. Well, I can certainly relate to liking narco-centric TV program, but that, yeah. that actually that actually opens up a really interesting, you know, okay, so we have the backdrop here, which is a leverage buyout, and this is something also that I think like anybody who's familiar with even Mitt Romney as an example, we're very aware of this type of predatory capitalism and primarily stories about how it has affected, uh, you know, blue-collar work. Um, right. you know, like Mitt Romney coming in and, you know, forgive me, but, you know, like nice ring ding factory you have there and, you know, <laughs> like, and, and wrecking, you know, people's lives and communities and this sort of thing. This is the same kind of tactic attached to a media conglomerate and affecting different types of, you know, symbolic, conceptual, journalistic brand work. The other thing that I liked about the piece, which I, I maybe we could dig into a little bit more uh, as well, is that notion that, and I think we've, We've seen a certain type, I mean, every, every, from the Hillary Clinton campaign to many failed startups, even like MTV's you know, Spanish language version of the uh, real world, essentially, that demography is destiny in a way that there's just this raw aggregate number, there's an increasing population of Spanish speaking, of Hispanic people, and uh, you know, it needs to be, that market needs to be greater served. Now, that is true. Um, but there's no distinction in that. There's no right. sense of like anticipating, well, maybe like everywhere else, like everybody else, there's going to be an increasing interest in, you know, Narcos content instead of soap opera content. Right. Or maybe people want uh, to be served in a way that isn't just, you know, Anglo content with a Spanish uh, voiceover. Maybe there's a completely different set of concerns. So I think what I also, what I also really liked about the piece is it was like, the, the demography is destiny also showed that just a lack of, in, of a sort of cultural strategy and intelligence sure. at ironically one of the biggest, you know, Spanish language conglomerates in the world. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it, we describe it sort of as, you know, corporate complacency. They yeah. essentially, you know, made a bet that they would be in such a good position to take on this growing market that they didn't continue making good stuff. Right. You know, they kept they kept pumping their tubes full of these telenovelas, even though that they were increasingly unpopular with the younger generation of people. And, and now you have Telemundo, which is a competing Spanish language media company, which is increasingly taking market share away from Univision. So now that now they're sort of playing catch up, they're sort of reorienting the sort of content that they produce. Um, and, you know, it's I guess we'll see what happens, uh, you know, to the extent that they can make up lost ground. Let's talk about the uh, the fusion fusion debacle um I, I i say you know i i will stipulate i mean i have i i have people you know friends and people i've known who who are very very talented people who are involved in fusion uh so i i do want to just sort of do that housekeeping both because it's absolutely you know it's true and i want to register that as an as a, on a sort of interpersonal level and also because it even actually highlights in my mind the just utter debacle that fusion was because they did right. have some very, very talented, um, you know, interesting people around. 
Yeah, I mean, in many ways, it was one of the more catastrophic media failures uh, that I can remember. They hired up all of this incredible talent. They pumped an immense amount of capital into this project. But at the end of the day, you know, a similar situation played out in which they were trying to target this increasingly multicultural market for millennials. Um, but they didn't have any sort of strategic direction within that to how to, to, to sort of carry them through how to actually go about attracting those people to make good stuff, to make sure they kept coming back for more. So over the course of years, you know, fusion just through fits and starts, you know, it, it changed direction multiple times. It went through various, you know, upsizings and downsizings and what have you. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it ended up, um, being offloaded by ABC and Disney, which was originally a partner, uh, in, in fusion and then, you know, became sort of a relatively unknown cable channel that very few people watch, which is the current state of play. Mm -hmm. Um, so it sort of, it, it does sort of fit in with this broader narrative within the company of Univision of, you know, having sort of the base level target in mind. There's this market out there that we have to tap into, but not actually going through the strategic steps uh, to actually make good things that people want to use. Right. Just, just pure quantitative, um, you know, well, X is here. So Y is there. So we'll mush it together without any actual, with the, you know, the sort of deeper sense of, of content and actual cultural strategy. You also, in the fusion story, there's a good part, uh, you explain, um, you know, the sort of role, the kind of corporate fiefdoms that developed in Univision as well. Right, right. Yeah. So, um, you know, Univision uh, and Fusion in particular was the brainchild of a guy named Isaac Lee, who's still an executive at the company. And what our reporting found is that over the course of years and particularly within Fusion, um, and I, you know, as we all know, this isn't unique to Fusion or Univision. This happens out in the corporate setting all the time. But executives rewarded their friends and pals with yep. their own personal fiefdoms. They, they said, oh, I have this new project. I know just the guy to lead this new project. Um, and that was obviously detrimental to the overall mission. Uh, when, you, when you sort of base decision making off of, you know, purely your own personal relationships as opposed to people's skill sets and expertise, then you're sort of bound for failure. So I think, you know, in many ways, fusion and, you know, Univision more broadly, as we say in the piece, is a, a sort of set of deep media deals cobbled together to create this huge conglomerate. But at the, at the end of the day, if you were just taking individual parts of that conglomerate, conglomerate and rewarding people that you personally like with control over those individual pieces, you're going to have a hard time bringing it into one holistic thing uh, that's valuable. What about the news side of Univision? I mean, this also brings to mind the other very basic conflict between a profit motive and news generation. And, and also, you know, in fact, I mean, multiple forms of deregulation, which we'll get to, you know, obviously deregulation of the financial sector, which led to these types of, you know, leverage buyouts and so on. Right. But also, uh, you know, uh, uh, deregulation and the allowing of this hyper concentration in media monopolies and how that distorts the whole media market. Univision also had a very respected news division, um, right. which in this sort of typical fashion of these companies was sort of held up as a defense. You know, when you criticize these things, they go, oh, wait a second, we've got these great reporters and we brought right. these great Jorge stories. Ramos. And you're yeah. like, okay, well, you're firing all of them. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's, that's one of the, the unspoken and really sad parts about all this. I mean, Univision Noticias is one of, if not the largest Spanish language news provider in the United States. There are tens of millions of people that rely on it for either their nightly news or their digital news and what have you. The digital side of Noticias has already undergone pretty extensive layoffs over the last couple of months or so. Um, it is to be seen the extent of those layoffs in the coming months, but it, it is being decimated. And, you know, my own company, Gizmodo Media Group, it's a collection of sites that includes, you know, Splinter, but also Jezebel, Gizmodo, Deadspin, et cetera. You know, we are coming to the realization that we are an extremely small part of this gigantic media conglomerate yeah. that mostly produces entertainment con content. So while, you know, they can go to these, 
you know, corporate presentations and presentations for advertisers and, you know, put forward journalists such as Jorge Ramos or such as my colleagues at Gizmodo Media Group and say we are producing fearless adversarial journalism. At the end of the day, we are secondary when it comes to their profit line. Right. Um. What's the, I mean, and, and then have there been an attempt, I mean, what, have there been, you know, merger talks? Have they tried to get bought out themselves? I mean, what, yeah, it just underlying again, as we sort of move towards the close, that same core contradiction that it, in spite of all of these um, problems and contradictions and poor strategy and mistakes, this is still a media conglomerate, partially which relies on, you know, television, which is dying, it's totally dying, uh, forgive me, uh, that is still actually bringing in a lot of money. Uh, and the only reason that this is actually fundamentally, even with all these other mishaps in crisis, is because of that leverage buyout lording right. over the company. Right. I mean, there have been some reports um, that Univision was exploring, you know, ways to, you know, sell off say Gizmodo Media Group, which is a very small portion of the company, we were unable to confirm those reports. They're just rumors in our mm-hmm. eyes. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, more broadly, private equity investors typically hold on to their investments for three to five years. And Univision's private equity investors have now been in the game for more than 10 years. Yeah. Uh, they have been unable to sell the company to this point, largely because of this massive debt that's weighing them down. Um, and this year, they abandoned plans for uh, an initial public offering, an IPO, Uh, to take the company public, which is typically seen as a way for investors to cash in and also for the company to deleverage, to pay down some of its debt. So at this point, they're undergoing cost cutting um, to get that, you know, that that debt to to EBITDA ratio down. Um, What the end game is for the private equity investors who are, you know, a group of five companies uh, who don't know much about content, don't know much about journalism, et cetera, what their end game is, is really an open question at this point. Can I, I mean, turn it, I guess, a little bit more sort of personal and direct to you? Um, I would have a lot of anxiety. I mean, I'm in a completely different, you know, space. But I think if I, if I was looking at, uh, you know, Sam Cedars just making these shambolic decisions and the majority report empire is crumbling. <laughs> and uh, we've got to do an investigative report here, uh, I, I guess, when he's, you know, uh, uh, on one of the days that I host or something or, uh, you know... It, it would it would be making me question obviously not only the leadership I'm in but also how I even conceive of myself in my own career. Now you know I've happened to follow a path which is completely like you know it, it actually is certainly in the private market, but it's direct you know audience relationship, you know audience membership, Patreon models. It's totally independent, um, and you know I think for those of us where it's able to actually work. I think it is, you know, it's, it's incredible. It's a, it's a, it's a real honor and privilege. There's obviously the nonprofit foundational model, which, you know, has a disadvantage of resources and a certain bureaucratic slowness. But then on the other hand, you know, the autonomy to do, you know, really, really important and adversarial journalism. Um, and, you know, and then sort of maybe like the intercept seems to be, you know, somewhere in between where there's a business model, right. they're making money, but there's also obviously some willingness, uh, you know, on behalf of an extremely wealthy patron to kind of, you know, uh, push something forward in a, in a, it, what seems to be in a very independent way. Do you like, wh- where do you see, you know, yourself in this story as a, as a media, a, a, as a journalist, as a reporter, uh, what, you know, does it make you think that the, you know, is the future really peer to peer? Is it outside of these companies? <laughs> right. Like what, you know, what, what does it make you think? I mean, to your first point yeah. about my own levels in, of anxiety. Uh, I mean, if you have any extra Xanax prescriptions lying around, <laughs> I will take them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I hear I mean, you, buddy. Yeah. I mean, so I'm a media reporter. So the news in the media industry is bad. It's typically bad. There are people who get laid off. Um, almost constantly, the advertising market is imploding. Facebook and Google are taking over everything. Yep. We have to, you know, base all of our decision making off of these tech giants that have their own sort of strategic imperatives. Um, but you know, in reporting that story out over the last, you know, four or so years that I've been doing this, I've never thought that it would be me. You just don't think that personally. Right. So, 
you know, a couple of months ago when Univision came to us and basically said, hey, we're bringing these management consultants. They're going to evaluate all of you and the job that you do. And then at the end of June, you're going to find out whether we're going to lay you off. I mean, everybody's anxiety levels just shot through the roof. So, I mean, what can we do to, do to do about that? I mean, on one hand, we have, you know, a good set of newsroom leaders who are just telling us to stay the course and keep doing our job and they have our backs, which is great. We have, you know, a union within our newsroom, which is great for solidarity and keeping yep. everyone together, keeping information um, spread throughout the staff, et cetera. Um, and then for me as a journalist and my colleagues, Laura and Kate, you know, what, what can we do about this? This is an incredibly important media company to tens of millions of people who use it. Yep. Um, and this is an incredibly important media story. So let's report the hell out of that story. So, you know, luckily our editors, you know, really had our backs. They said we could do this. They would fight for us. Um, and we put a lot of time and effort into it. And I think, you know, the story that we ended up telling laid out not only the challenges facing us as people at Gizmodo Media, this small speck of dust within this large media conglomerate, but also the challenges facing, you know, journalism in an environment that is, you know, facing incredible economic headwinds. So, I mean, I think at the end of the day, I'm incredibly pessimistic about mm -hmm. digital media companies and their ability to make it uh, in this economic environment. But, you know, the fact that we were able to do this story does give me hope that companies like Gizmodo Media, which are companies that will say things that other companies can't say or won't say, um, that does give me some some case for optimism. Yeah, I mean, it's right. The irony, I mean, the irony of the piece is that it's a, it's an incredible piece uh, and it sheds light on so much. And it it's basically the demonstration of why we need this and why this type of reporting cannot be subject or held hostile or hostage by the type of nonsense, nonsense and financialization. And also I'm glad you pointed out the whole other world. when we talk about how, you know, these tech companies in these, you know, completely unaccountable and monopolistic fashion is just decimating so much. I mean, this is why we need, and you could say, you know, sure, Gizmodo is a speck of dust, I guess. I mean, it's a speck of dust that I rely on in my reading diet. Uh, right. You know, it's a very, very good one. It's very important. So I don't know. I mean, we're all going to need to, you know, broaden out that union and think collectively of just how we keep, you know, forwarding and sustaining uh, the material lives of people who do this work, um, you know, right. independent of all these games that harm it. Right. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I think, you know, obviously wanted to, to tell a story of Univision and, you know, how Gawker Media and now Gizmodo Media are basically along for the ride of whatever happens to this massive company. But I do hope that the takeaway from our story is that this is what is under threat. This, yep. you know, deeply reported 8,000 word story. You know, we are literally criticizing the people who write our checks um, and, you know, they could fire us later next month. It's a possibility. Who knows what will happen? But at the end of the day, you know, this sort of reporting, this clear-eyed, uh, you know, important story storytelling is is the thing that we provide. Um, so if you want to make cuts to the company, if you want to lay people off, you're going to get less of this, and that's that's just the bottom line. David uh, Erberti, he's a media reporter at Splinter. It's an excellent piece. Univision is an effing mess, except that's fully spelled out. Um, and I know I'm an enormous hypocrite for abbreviating it, given the amount of times that I curse on the show, but I'm trying to do better. Uh, David, I really, really appreciate your time. And um, we'll all be following this and, uh, you know, trying to have as much solidarity as possible. I appreciate that. Thanks for having me on. Thank you so much. Okay, everybody. Uh, yeah, I would really recommend that's that's the type of piece that you can read as a case study uh, that will open up the door to understanding... I, a lot of predicaments we're in, uh, financial media, inequality, uh, journalism, all of it. Uh, great piece. Okay. We're going to go to the fun half, become a member of the majority report today, majority.fm slash become a member, or you can click, I believe it's the support tab on the majority.fm uh, homepage, just coffee.coop. 
fair trade tea, coffee, or chocolate. Get the Majority Report blend. It's a win-win-win for everyone. You can also subscribe to the show on iTunes, leave the show a review, and subscribe to the Majority Report YouTube channel. You can check out uh, my show, The Michael Brooks Show, TMBS at patreon.com slash TMBS. Uh, Waz Lambre and I, Wazni Lambre, are co-hosting a new show, Woke Bros, which is available uh, exclusively for TMBS uh, patrons um, and Count the Dings patrons. So it's a whole other offering on the uh, Patreon side for for my show. And you can, of course, uh, check out, if you haven't checked it out yet, you can check out the public shows on Majority Report YouTube channel and also Michael Brooks' show on iTunes. Check out Antifada. That's Jamie Peck's show. You can find The Antifada both on their Patreon page as well as also uh, Antifada is on iTunes, right? You can check out The Antifada on iTunes and uh, all of Jamie's work on her Patreon page as well, Jamie Peck patreon okay uh 646-257-3920 646-257-3920 i am zero open see you in the front half Keep talking.